information and go, what's going on in the county. We last year in November did also an immigration forum, and so this is a great follow-up to see what's happened since and what's going on moving forward. Um, so I want to thank you all for being here tonight. A few library announcements before we get the lead up here. Um, if you don't know, we are in the midst of our Santa Barbara Reads, which is where we choose one book, and we hope the whole community will read it and join us in conversations and events. So this year, we chose Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It is the 200th anniversary of the publication, um, and we are really excited to explore the book that created science fiction and was written by an unwed teenage mother. So it's a really interesting book with a fantastic background um, that many people don't necessarily know about. So I encourage you to pick up, we have a booklet in the back of the, there's about 35 events left this month. We had 70 total, so there's still plenty of ways to join in and get involved. Our keynote is on the 23rd, so next week, Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. We will have two UCSB English professors in conversation with one of our librarians about the context in which Mary Shelley is writing the book, the themes that stem from it, and the relevance that it still has 200 years later. So we encourage you to join us for that. As well, there is a flyer on the back table that might be of interest to you. We also have a social justice book club. We meet on the third Tuesdays of the month, so you can essentially Go to the Social Justice Book Club on Tuesday. The third Wednesday of the month is the Civic Forum with the League, so you can just plan out your, your third week of the month as your, your active Civic Action Month. Um, so we encourage you to join us for all of those. As well, last thing you have on your seat, um, a feedback form. These are super helpful for the library, um, both constructive and great comments. They help us know where you guys are hearing about the events, when you would like events, and as well the feedback specifically on this event so that we can bring more events like it, get better at what we do here at the library and with our partners. So we appreciate when you do fill those out for us. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce Lindsay Baker, who is going to tell us about our evening. Welcome and good evening. Thank you for being with us here this evening. If you're a member of the League of Women Voters, Santa Barbara, our new directory has been mailed out. So watch your mail. This is the new directory and it'll, you should be getting it any day now. Last year, the Independent and the Fund for Santa Barbara embarked on a new fundraising program called Santa Barbara Gives. This year, the League of Women Voters Santa Barbara has been selected to join the nonprofits in this, um, in this program. You'll be reading about it in the Independent. It's not, the whole thing's not completely formalized yet, but they have a challenge grant going so that if you donate anything, at this time, up until October 27, it will be matched. And we have some forms in the back that explain it all to you. Okay. Um, next month, for our forum, it will be on November 14. We've been changing dates, we've been changing times, so you have to watch the Independent, the Santa Barbara News Press, and read your channel voter if you're a member, or look at your constant contact emails. It will be on the 14th because Thanksgiving comes the next week, and we, it would have been the day before Thanksgiving. It will be back to noon, so November 14th, at noon will be Tanya Israel giving a program called Beyond the Bubble Dialogue Across Political Lines. Tonight we'd like to thank Gary Atkins for doing sound and um, I would like, to, oh, <laughs> and I would like to introduce Susan Horn 
As everyone knows, this is a big voting year, and Susan is the director of voter service for the league. Oops. Hey, everybody. Hi. How are you doing? Oh, good. So I just want to tell you briefly that on the table in the back, it's not obvious because it's not on the sides and it's by a closed door, but on the back there are some very good things if you're interested. Um, the first thing, of course, is the registration to vote. How many people, if you can you raise your hand, I'm just so curious, how many people are registered to vote? Thank you. <laughs> and how many people are interested in getting out the vote? Because, you know, half the, more than half the people that voted in the uh, registered people, more than half did not vote in the, in the election in June. So we really need that next step of actually voting. So we have a couple things that will help with that. We have pledged, pledge cards because that's one of the things that shows people are more likely to vote if they sign this. And we have, for the same reason, um, I will vote stickers, which are really for your friends because the research shows that if, you, if someone has a friend and they know they're going to vote, they're more likely to vote. So this is basically for your friends to see. So they go, oh, she's voting. I should too. So please take some of these on your way out if you're interested. And we have some, also some um, election information things out. So, um, and if you're interested in joining the league, learn more about it, pick up the flyer, and we're going we're gonna to do our best to get out the vote. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Indeed, the heart of the league is getting out the vote, getting, you know, pay, paying attention to democracy. A big part of that is you're coming here to learn um, about what is going on in the community today about immigration. Um, I want to thank the committee that helped put this together. Bev King, who's, as always, in the back doing membership. Julie Sulwald, uh, Bev Herbert, Lindsay, and myself. Um, we were lucky enough to get four terrific speakers. I think you'll, you'll um, get a lot out of this today. Um, people who have been working in, in, in this area all the time. Um, the format is going to be, each of them is going to have about 15 minutes to talk to you about what they do and what they think is important. Um, we will do questions after that. Questions are going to be, I'm, we're going to ask you to write your questions on those little red pieces of paper that are on your seat and there are extra ones up front if you are very um, inquisitive. Um, and uh, what will happen is between speakers, I'll just ask you to hold up your questions in the air and someone will come around and pick those up. We will wait until the end of all four speakers and then we're going to put the questions together and try to figure out what the, what, what the, the, the questions are that need to be asked. Um, we will try to uh, take the rest of the time we have that way. Um, there, the odds are we are not going to have questions from the audience. So if you are here to make a speech, uh, you're not going to get to do that. I'm really sorry. Um, that's about it. Um, uh, I guess, with having done that, um, I will uh, go get my introduction. Our first speaker is Erica Reyes. Um, Erica is a district representative for Congressman Salud Carbajal and is a native of Napomo. Uh, she became Representative Carbajal's chief spoke per spokesperson regarding immigration matters, was a staffer for retired Congresswoman Lois Capps, and is a frequent advocate for Planned Parenthood and was an appointee to, she was an appointee to the Lucia, Lucia Marr School District Board at age 22. That's pretty amazing. Um, she acts as the local, local point person of our congressional representative on all issues re related to immigration. It's all yours, Erica. Hi, good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Great, great. Well, thank you, David, for inviting me here to present. Um, I have a lot of content to get to, so I'll be very brief with my intro, but I wanted to thank the League as well. Um, I've been working on and off on immigration issues with the Congressional Office for about six years now, um, but I really wanted to kind of get into a broad stroke of the last two years of what we've been seeing with changes at the federal level, and uh, so I'll be speaking much more broadly and bring it down to the local level, um, as my fellow presenters will be speaking to the local level as well. So 
Just the disclaimer before I get going, as you guys all know, in the news we see something about immigration-related news, policy changes coming up every single day. So whatever I say now could already be invalid um, with new stats that are coming out. It's, um, I didn't provide any handouts simply for the reason that things are changing so fast that it's impossible to keep up and we want to try to save paper. So I did put together a little um, PowerPoint presentation here. Um, Jay, could you help get this up? I'm not sure how to. Oh. Here it is, yes. All right. Um, thank you. Okay. So, um, just doing general updates on federal policy and kind of the local implications we're having here. So I want to start at the beginning of um, our current administration and where they started with changing some of the immigration policies. We haven't seen anything really change legally. There's been nothing legislatively that has passed. But what is changing is at the administrative level with some of the policies and the rules. So I'll be going over um, all of that next. Um, so to begin with, we saw changes with the travel ban um, that included restriction, restricting immigration travel, whether that's an immigrant visa or a non-immigrant visa, um, coming in from the countries included here, Libya, Yemen, Syria, Iran, Somalia, Venezuela, and North Korea. Um, most recently, the Supreme Court upheld that the uh, executive office does have the ability to restrict travel um, in the name of national security. So those are still currently in place now. Um, I also work as a district representative on constituent cases, and we've had several cases come up um, with family members who are United States citizens here uh, who have family who is not able to travel at all. These are children, um, married spouses, uh, parents, and there's just no way for them to get through. There is a waiver process that is available for family members but then there's an additional administrative processing that happens. And an administrative processing is kind of veiled in um, some secrecy. Uh, it's basically security background checks happens anywhere from seven to 100 times on an individual's case, and it can stop it from progressing. So that's what we're seeing with the cases here that are stuck in the travel ban. Um, their waiver maybe got approved, but they're still undergoing background investigations that just can't be cleared. We don't know when they will be resolved. Um, so the travel ban is, is still active now. Uh, with DACA, uh, that's something that was also largely in the news. There's about approximately 700,000 dreamers that are here in the United States uh, who are living in a state of uncertainty because they don't know what's going to happen going forward. As of September of 2017, the administration did say that they were going to phase out the DACA program. Um, uh, then it was fought in the courts. Most recently, it was heard in the Ninth District Circuit Court of Appeals. They have not yet said what they are going to do, what their final decision is going to, to be. And just as I gave that disclaimer, you never know what's going to happen. Just today, the Department of Justice did come out with a letter saying that if a decision is not made by October 31st on DACA, they're going to request that the Supreme Court take up the case as soon as possible to try to get a decision made. Um, there are several pieces of legislation that have been brought to the floor to try to resolve the issue. There's usually other pieces involved with it, um, and so nothing has actually been voted on um, and passed for um, a DACA fix. Um, but we do stress that renewals are currently allowed if there is somebody who has DACA status who is going to be expiring soon. We do recommend that they um, either speak with an attorney if they have a complicated case or they go ahead and file their paperwork to get that status renewed, regardless of what's, hap what's gonna happen um, in the courts or if it happens legislatively, um, they'll have the status until their current card expires. So we are recommending that um, folks, if they can, go ahead and renew their DACA status. We've heard a lot about the zero tolerance policy and the family separations. It's one of the topics that maintained um, its kind of life in the news cycle the longest out of any other news thing that's happened in the last two years. Um, basically what happened was it switched individuals who were illegally entering 
the United States, a, a non-port of entry, um, to be prosecuted criminally. So under uh, Health and Human Services requirements, this required the children to be separated because the parents were technically under a criminal charge. Um, so that resulted in, as we've seen, 2,654 separations. Um, the numbers that I have up here are a little bit fluid. There's con conflicting information coming out um, in the court cases between the ACLU and HHS um, as how many children have actually been reunited. But as of the numbers that I saw, 2,070 children have been discharged, and that means they've either been um, put with their family members or a family member in the United States or their country of origin. Um, the, the child turned 18 and they were able to leave on their own. Um, they were placed with a sponsor, um, but there's still an estimated between, and it's a, it's a very large number, 245 to 66 children that they're disputing have not yet been placed. Um, we're also recently in the news, there was talks of the administration possibly bringing up another family separation because of the number of immigrants that are coming to the border. There was a caravan um, estimated 1,600 to 3,000, I heard, um, coming in from Honduras, Guatemala area. Um, and so the administration is floating the idea of doing another kind of family, family separation policy they're calling it a binary policy, basically saying that um, the family has to choose whether or not the children will be separated or if they will be held indefinitely in detention as a family. Under the Flores Agreement, which um, the Department of Justice is trying to remove, a child cannot be held in detention for longer than 20 days. Uh, so they're trying to figure out in the courts how exactly that would work in um, the legal parts of it aren't my expertise, just the policy areas. So that's something that's been floated, whether it's, it's legal or not, I, I can't say. Um, that will be up to the immigration judges, but that's kind of where we are right now with um, the family separation policies. Big changes have come with the asylum policy changes. So this is somebody, and a lot of the people who are coming to our southern border are trying to seek asylum. Um, it was set in, back in 2014, a precedent that people could seek asylum based on fleeing gang violence from their country of origin or if they were um, victims of domestic violence in their home, that includes both physical, verbal, and sexual assault um, that was happening in their home. Um, most recently, in June 11th, 2018, um, our Attorney General reversed that um, precedent and said that cases uh, will no longer be considered for asylum based on fleeing gang violence or um, fleeing domestic violence. Here right now we have a backlog of asylum cases of about two and a half to three years. So somebody goes to the border, seeks asylum, they remain in the United States awaiting a hearing before a judge and that's when they'll have their asylum case heard. At that point, it's approved or denied. They can stay in the United States or they must return. Um, but so those people that backlog, they came to the United States under the assumption that they could claim asylum based on those um, gang, fleeing gang violence or domestic violence, um, despite that their case will be considered under the rules that are currently in place for their hearing. So if they came in two years ago, have a hearing tomorrow um, based on a domestic violence case, then it is very unlikely that it will um, be approved for asylum. Um, that is currently a lawsuit that's also pending. There's a lot of stuff happening in the courts right now. Uh, ACLU has taken that up, uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Unaccompanied minors are um, a huge number of children who are in the United States shelters, whether that's temporary or long-term shelters. These are children who entered the United States under the age of 18 uh, alone. So they didn't have a parent with them. They just came in and under HHS rules, um, they must be taken care of. So right now, there are about 100 shelters. Um, Torneo, Texas, which the congressman did visit, uh, during the early parts of the family separations was built as a temporary shelter. 
Um, it held about 1,300 children at the beginning. Um, it has since been expanded to have about 3,800 beds, and there are children that are being taken from the permanent shelters into the temporary Torneo shelter um, with the hope that they will be placed soon. Um, it's a lot different than the permanent shelter because it doesn't have any formal schooling areas. Um, it's a tent city in the desert, so you can imagine it's very hot, um, and it just doesn't have quite the accommodations that some of the more permanent shelters have across the United States. Um, so that's a, a big part. We, we focused a lot kind of in the media at least on the family separations, but you think about these 13,000 kids who are uh, alone in a country by themselves living in basically group homes. Um, so that's something that they're in the process of, of trying to find placements for and uh, whether that's in the United States or trying to find somebody back in the country of origin who can care. But they have to go through the same process that the children being placed from the family separations were. Uh, so there's background investigations that go into it. They can't be placed with an undocumented family member who's residing in the United States. Um, I've had one or two cases of this where um, there was a family member in Morro Bay who um, was trying to be placed with their, their uh, family member in New York, and it took about 135 days. They say on average it's 59. Um, so that's what's going on with unaccompanied minors. I got my three minutes, so I'm gonna go faster. Um, a big change that's happening right now is public charge. Um, it, right now it's in a 60-day public comment period. Basically what it's trying to do is, public charge has been something that's on immigration law for a very long time. Um, but it's trying to change the way people are allowed to come into the United States as legal permanent residents. So if it changes the definition to say that if you are going to be primarily dependent is the old definition, um, but if you're getting even basic, modest public benefits at all, um, then you, that could be a reason for denial of becoming a legal permanent resident. And that's not based on your uh, receiving of SNAP or emergency Medicaid or WIC or energy assistance in the past. It can even be a projection of you obtaining that. So there's a lot of organizations that are really, really focusing on this. Um, if you're interested in making a public comment, the period is open until December 10th of 2018 and the website is uh, regulations.gov. It's a hot topic, so it was the first thing that pops up there that I saw. Um, it's about a 450 page public charge summary sheet of the rule change. So I, I, that's as much as I can summarize in the amount of time I have, um, but definitely you can go on there, uh, just Google search it, and there's a ton of information about how this will impact our local communities, especially with families uh, with maybe young children who just need a little bit of extra help with um, buying the groceries. Upcoming legislation, H.R. 7059, um, was just introduced by Representative McCarthy, our neighbor here in Bakersfield, and it addresses the southern border wall and security. Um, a lot of the reason why none of the legislation was passed um, in this year was because the president said that he wouldn't sign legislation that did not include funding for his wall or for uh, increased security at the border. So this would do that. It also has some elements of changing um, your ability to come in as a legal permanent resident or um, your citizenship. Um, and as of December 7th of 2018, um, there's likely to be a vote on this uh, because Department of Homeland Security will run out of funding at that time. I don't know if you guys know our government almost shut down like a month ago, September 30th. Uh, they did a continuing resolution for Department of Homeland Security so they could bring that up for a vote again in December. So around December 7th, if not sooner, we'll have um, a large package of funding that will come up. And this is my last slide on, on ICE enforcement, which will segue nicely into what Sheriff Brown has to speak on. Um, a lot of the thing that we've seen is sanctuary state laws have changed, and that's changed how enforcement is happening here in our community. It used to be ICE would go to the jail facilities to pick up somebody who had committed a crime and um, did not have legal status here in the United States. That's no longer allowed in many cases. Um, so now we're seeing 
ice more visible in our communities, going to homes, performing traffic stops. Um, there's been continued enforcement um, based on criminal history that has sometimes resulted in collateral arrests of people who are not being targeted by ICE. Um, but we're also in seeing an increased number of cases that are no longer being granted um, stays of removal, so for um, humanitarian reasons. So I know um, NIE and Sheriff Brown will speak to that more. So that was the end. I look forward to your questions at the end. Ooh, that was a lot to put in. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, our next speaker, as has already been some, somewhat introduced, is Sheriff Bill Brown. Um, recently re-elected as Sheriff of Santa Barbara County for the fourth term, Bill Brown began his law enforcement career in 1977 as a police officer and then as police chief in Moscow, Idaho. In 1995, he was selected to be the chief of police in Lompoc, where he served until being elected as Santa Barbara's sheriff in, 19, in 2006. Uh, sheriff Brown is the immediate past president of the California State Sheriff's Association and the past president of the California Police Chiefs Association, the only person to have ever held both of those positions. And he's gonna take a position right here in front of you. Well, thank you very much. I wanna start with a few thank yous. First of all, I wanna thank the League of Women Voters for putting this on and inviting me at a time when I'm not running for anything right now. So I appreciate that very much. It's much nicer to be here when that's the case. I want to thank David Landecker for uh, facilitating this evening, my fellow panelists for being here with me as well, and I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight and showing your interest in, uh, in this subject. Immigration is a, uh, is a topic, is an issue that is very, uh, very controversial, it's very emotional, and it can be very divisive in our community and in communities across our country. And um, it is something, nevertheless, that we have to deal with. And as is, is often the case, we have extreme beliefs on both sides of an issue that can cause conflict and turmoil and can cause uh, acrimony. And again, as is often the case, law enforcement <clears throat> is often kind of stuck in the middle of uh, the issue. And here, as a local law enforcement uh, executive and local law enforcement officer, I, I want to just emphasize a couple things. Uh, to you and to those members of the community who may be watching. And the first and foremost thing I want to emphasize is that we in local law enforcement are not responsible for, nor do we want to be, for enforcing immigration law. The enforcement of immigration law is a prerogative of the federal government, not the state, not the locals. And um, I believe very strongly that we need to establish trust within our communities, and that includes within our immigrant communities, we want members of the immigrant community to contact us in law enforcement if they witness a crime or if they are the victim of a crime and we don't want them to be deterred from calling us to investigate that crime because they think they might get deported as a result of that. And, and in many instances, there are people in the immigrant community who are not aware of the differences, the fact that we don't have a national police force in the United States. They may come from a country that does. They may. Uh, have police organizations that are corrupt and, and that uh, are, are uh, abusive and, and the reality is we want to make sure that our communities are not that way. We want to make sure that there is that trust uh, amongst the immigrant community. On the same token, we want to make sure that people who commit crimes against uh, anyone who lives here in the United States and lives in our county for sure are held accountable. And if it turns out that people who commit those crimes are people who are here and are undocumented, uh, in certain instances, we want to make sure that the, the law is followed at the federal level that will remove that person from our community so that they're not engaged in a continued commission of crime. And, and the reality is that oftentimes people who are undocumented and are uh, committing crimes, serious crimes in the community, are committing those crimes at a disproportionately high rate against other members of the immigrant community. And it's important that we uh, protect our community by making sure that those people are held accountable. Um, like everything else involved with immigration, I think it all boils down to one thing, and that is that there is a need, and you hear this from people on both sides of the aisle, 
certainly from people who hold political office or are running for it, that we have a strong need for comprehensive immigration reform. And until we achieve comprehensive immigration reform in this country, we are going to have um, problems and issues that relate to immigration. We need to have uh, um, clarity of the law as well. We have uh, an instance here, as we do in some other instances, marijuana is the one that jumps to mind, where we have federal law and state law that, if not in conflict with each other, are incongruent and are, uh, they have certain um, conflicts between the two of them. Uh, the sheriff's office, as I said, we're kind of stuck in the middle, and we're trying to achieve the right balance. Uh, the need to work continually with our federal law enforcement partners, and I want to make, uh, make, make one uh, thing certain here. I'm not here tonight to defend ICE in any way. They can speak for themselves, but a lot of people don't realize, I think, that ICE is more than just um, the enforcement and removal uh, operation of the United States government when it comes to immigrants. They do have a section or an arm that is called uh, enforcement and removal. But ICE is the umbrella under which all of Homeland Security investigations are organized. All the people who are responsible at the federal level for investigating crimes involving the, the actual um, incidents of or the potential for domestic or international terrorism uh, international terrorism are our homeland security investigators who are under ICE, they're I, they're ICE employees. And we are kind of unique here in California in that we have, uh, being a coastal community that's relatively close to the southern border, we have had numerous instances where we have had Ponga boat incursions where people come up from uh, south of the border in Ponga boats in a very dangerous journey to come to uh, our shores and they land, they try to land surreptitiously and offload their illicit cargoes of either drugs or people who are coming into the country illegally. And as a result of that, those incursions, we have had numerous instances where we have a requirement where we have to work uh, with Homeland Security investigators, ICE investigators, to determine um, who these people are when they're apprehended because they're, more often than not, they are, they are foreign nationals who we do not have any idea uh, who they are. So there is a, there is a definite need for us to, to be uh, able, as law enforcement officers, to continue to work with ICE. Um, we also need to follow the law in California that has changed as a result of a piece of legislation uh, SB 54, which enacted changes in the California government code, there are, there are now parameters in different ways that we can interact with ICE. And uh, we are, uh, as enforcers of the law, we have to obviously abide by the law, and we have to um, take those, uh, that this new law and the new policy uh, directives that come as a result of it have to be implemented. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize the fact that we are, we are not enforcing uh, immigration law at the local level. And in fact, my history, uh, the very first time I think I was at a League of Women Voters forum was a candidate forum when I first ran for office back in 2006. And my opponent at the time publicly suggested that members of the Sheriff's Office should uh, participate in the 287G program and be uh, become federally deputized immigration officers and should work uh, to uh, assist the federal government in, in deporting people. And I, at the time, was very vocal and said that, that was a terrible idea because of that trust issue that I, that I just mentioned earlier. We, we cannot uh, be seen in that light by people who we are uh, tasked with protecting and serving. And uh, indeed, the sheriff uh, and, and uh, by um, delegation, all of my deputies, you know, we are, we are, I am elected and we serve all of the people of Santa Barbara County. It doesn't matter what, what, what political affiliation you may have. It doesn't matter what your immigrant status is. If you're a resident, if you are here in our county, uh, we are going to uh, protect you. That is what we do. Um, 
as mentioned uh, by, by David in the introduction, I was uh, recently, I just finished a term as the president of the California State Sheriff's Association. And we in the CSSA were, were really very vocal about our opposition to SB 54. And um, we had a lot of public discourse and we had a lot of um, uh, information that was, uh, that was given to the media as a result of it. Um, I can tell you that I think that uh, SB 54 um, was a law that was hastily prepared. It was in its original format something that would have been um, really terrible for communities. Um, it's a convoluted law and ultimately it was uh, substantially modified through the intervention of Governor Jerry Brown. Uh, who recognized that there was uh, a strong political desire for this law to pass, but on the same token that if it passed in its original format, uh, there would be virtually no way for local law enforcement to, uh, to work with federal authorities when it came to uh, people who had committed crimes in the community and were, were, were wanted at the same time by those federal authorities. Um, it was modified extensively, it's much better uh, it was much better in the form that it was enacted than what it was originally, but it still has, in our view, in the sheriff's views, a, a number of flaws. Um, perhaps the, the biggest one of which is that it doesn't permit us to notify ICE of the release of a suspect from our jail if that person bails out. And uh, to give you an idea of why this is a problem, um, to the, in the county to the south of us in Ventura, there was a case where uh, a, a suspect was arrested after a lengthy investigation for a child molestation that had involved a juvenile uh, female who had been molested for a number of years in an ongoing basis. Suspect was arrested for that, uh, that case. It was determined, uh, ICE determined that that person was in the country illegally. They uh, sent a notification, um, a release notification request to the sheriff's office um, but before that person um, was arraigned and before that person was, uh, went to court and, and, and uh, presumably would have been convicted, that person made bail and they made bail and were released from jail. And under the provisions of the law, there was no mechanism for the sheriff's office to notify ICE about that release. Uh, a day or so later, ICE contacted the sheriff's office and wanted that person to be taken into custody and were told that, they, that he had bailed out. ICE went out and looked for that individual and surmised that he had uh, fled the country and that he was in all likelihood in Mexico. So the, the problem obviously in that case and, and others like it is that that victim, there won't be any justice for that victim and the potential is there for other victims uh, to be victimized by that, that suspect uh, who, who fled uh, uh, accountability. Um, SB 54 is, um, is, is, as I mentioned, not without controversy and it's, it's been challenged several times. There's a federal lawsuit that is uh, underway right now where it was challenged by the Department of Justice and recently a state court judge in Orange County ruled that the law conflicts with the city of Huntington Beach's rights as a charter city and is therefore um, illegal. Um, that judge issued a writ of mandate that the state cannot enforce the law, the so-called sanctuary state law, uh, in the city of Huntington Beach. And to give you some perspective, um, there are 121 out of the 482 cities in California that are charter cities. So this law doesn't apply to counties, countywide, it doesn't apply necessarily even globally to uh, charter cities, but it does um, uh, it does uh, perhaps uh, show that there is uh, it's forthcoming. It's unclear at this point, but it may show that the judge's ruling uh, will impact other charter cities. Um, the bottom line is this: um, we do our best in law enforcement to follow the law, and procedurally, we do that. Um, ICE access to inmates has declined substantially since the passage of SB 54 and just to give you an indication as to how that is taking effect. Um, in 2017, ICE requested notification on 479 
uh, of the 14,619 inmates that we released that year, 479 requests, that was 3.3% of our total inmate population. Uh, that same year, they picked up 351 of those 479, or about 73.2%, that they had requested notification on. And the total number, uh, the percentage of inmates that were picked up as reflected our total inmates was about 2.4%. In 2018, year to date, ICE has requested notification on 336 of 8,998 inmates who have been released, or 3.7%, roughly the same, just a little bit higher uh, percentage. But to date, they've picked up only 69 of those uh, 8,998 inmates. Uh, I'm sorry, of the 336 inmates that they requested notification on. So that's 20.5%, so a significant decrease in the percentage and it's about 0.8% of our inmates overall. And I want to emphasize that they're not picking up everyone that they request a notification on. And in fact, there were four particular cases that I wish they really had come uh, and picked up persons. We had one person who had been in our jail 42 times. Uh, was in there for a simple drunken public charge, but he had uh, felony narcotics uh, priors. He wasn't picked up. We had another person who had been in our jail 25 times was in there for uh, felony spousal abuse, uh, was not picked up. We had another that had been in jail 35 times. He was in for a DUI, uh, misdemeanor to uh, battery. He wasn't picked up. And then one more that was in for 19 times. Um, and uh, he also was not picked up. He was in a charge for vandalism, burglary, and had a previous vandalism uh, felony charge as well. So. I'm going to leave it there at this point. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but again, the bottom line is I think that we're, we're, we're working to uh, work within the confines of the law with respect to SB 54, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Brown. I apologize. I didn't say before that if you have a question that you've written down, now's the time to put it up in the air and have someone pick it up. And you might want to write on there if there's a particular person you want to address that question to on our panel. Um, speaking of our panel, our next panelist um, is Anai Mendoza. Um, if you are a reader of The Independent, you probably know more about her than I'm about to tell you because she was um, well profiled in that. Uh, she's the executive director of the Immigrant Legal Defense Center, the ILDC, a new nonprofit organization on the Central Coast dedicated to providing equal access to justice and due process to indigent immigrants by enlisting volunteer attorneys to represent immigrants in deportation proceedings, primarily bond hearings, and in educating the community on their due process rights. The ILDC, the only organization in the Central Coast which provides deportation defense systematically, was formed out of a coalition of immigrant serving organizations convened by the Fund for Santa Barbara. Prior to joining the ILDC, Anai served as an accredited representative working with asylum seekers facing deportation proceedings in New York and at the largest family detention center in Dilly, Texas. Anai herself is a DACA recipient. She is a Harvard graduate and she is an awardee of the White House Champion of Change Award. We're lucky to have her here. Thank you, Annette. Thank you for having me. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. I'm going to pull up my slide over here. So as David mentions, my name is Anaí Mendoza. I work with the Immigrant Legal Defense Center. We're a new nonprofit really dedicated to justice and due process for immigrant communities. So before I talk to you a little bit about what the Immigrant Legal Defense Center does, let's first talk about our immigrant population here locally. There are about 100,000 immigrants living in Santa Barbara County. 43,000 of them are undocumented. Um, which accounts for 9% of the population. So compared to LA, it's the same percentage. 9% of the LA population is also undocumented. 
Um, of those immigrants residing, residing in our region, 86% have resided in the county for five or more years. So these are long-term immigrants, people that you, you know, probably clean your house or um, work in construction. Um, and then 48% of all children, that's nearly half, um, are living in a household where one or more parent is foreign born. Now, um, if you look at our undocumented population, uh, a professor at UC San Diego notes that uh, based on a study that he conducted in the southern states, more than 15.4% of individuals who are undocumented are eligible for a type of immigration relief. They just haven't had the opportunity to speak to an immigration attorney. Um, so now if we take that into account, who's our immigrant population, the next question becomes, who is being placed in deportation proceedings in our region? And we do have a number of asylum seekers coming from Central America. As Erica noted, it's now more difficult for individuals to get asylum, but people who are survivors of domestic violence in other regions are still getting asylum, just under a different category. Um, Aside from asylum seekers, we also have unaccompanied minors, mainly in Santa Maria. These are kids who are coming to the U.S., um, fleeing violence in their home countries, and coming to reuni with, reunify with one of their parents. The other group of people that are placed in deportation proceedings in our region are people who are picked up by ICE here locally. So, as you all know, um, I'm sure you all have seen various newspaper articles referencing the various raids that have been happening in our community. And I just want to note that immigration enforcement isn't something new. Maybe it's something new that you hear about today because it's getting more press coverage, but it has always been taking place in our region. And what has changed is the priorities for enforcement. Whereas before, people who had certain criminal convictions were priorities for enforcement. Now, anyone, regardless of that, can be detained. Um, and so these are just a few clips of newspaper articles of, of recent cases of individuals in our community. Now, let's talk a little bit about what happens when an individual is picked up by ICE. Um, they are sent to one of these two processing centers. We have one in Santa Maria and one in Camarillo. These are processing centers. They're not held there long term, maybe two to three hours. From there, they're sent to a remote detention center, usually one in Adelanto in the high desert. Uh, or they could be sent to James Music or Theo Lacey run by the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Both of those detention centers have a combined 958 individuals that they detain at any given time. And the Adelanto Detention Center detains about 1,900 people at any given time. Now, it's important to note that these are, these are administrative detention centers, so people are being held there for purposes of immigration to have the opportunity to speak to a judge. They're not being held there for criminal violations. The people that are there that have committed crimes have already completed their sentence on these crimes, and they're only being held there to see an immigration judge. Now, this is interesting to point out because these detention centers, Adelanto in particular, is run by a private prison company and operated much like a criminal place of confinement. Uh, Adelanto is run by the GEO company. And a recent uh, surprise government inspection found uh, nooses hanging in cells, uh, misuse of solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is used in administrative uh, holdings, um, and delayed medical care. They have two dentists for a population of 1,900 people. Um, and most people think of dentistry as, you know, cosmetic work, but it involves people who need, have extreme pain and need something removed. Um, and so these findings led investigators to, to say that these things pose a significant health and safety risk for people that are being held there. Um, now let's talk a little bit about access to representation. In California, 68% of people who are being held at one of these immigrant detention centers, again, ad being held administratively to appear before an immigration judge and see if they're eligible for relief, 68% of those people do not have representation. So unlike our criminal court system, individuals who are held for immigration purposes are not entitled to an attorney at the government's expense. What this means is that individuals 
must find their own private immigration attorney, and this often can cost anywhere between $1,500 to $20,000, $30,000. And the people that the Immigrant Legal Defense Center works with are unable to afford these very steep legal fees. So now let's talk a little bit about the people that are lucky enough to get a nonprofit to represent them or to pay a private immigration attorney to represent them. People who are represented, 33% of those that are detained immigrants that have an attorney win their case. This is compared to individuals who are not detained, somebody who's been able to get out on, from immigrant detention on a bond. 71% of those people win their case. So what this means is that if you are not detained and your case is not on a fast track, um, if you're out with your family, if you're able to raise money for an attorney, if you're able to um, be with your children, gather evidence, help your attorney prepare your case, 71% of those people actually win their case. So this is really important to the Immigrant Legal Defense Center because we wanna make sure that people have the best opportunity to be able to stay in the country if they're eligible for relief. So in Santa Barbara County, despite our two processing centers that I mentioned, we don't have any organization before the Immigrant Legal Defense Center that represents people in deportation proceedings. And so what this means is that many people from our region go unrepresented even though they're eligible to stay in the country, are still deported, and they face huge legal fees that they have to pay in order to stay. And so what the Immigrant Legal Defense Center did in, when we got started was go to the private bar. And what we asked these volunteer attorneys to do is represent people who are, again, unrepresented, eligible to remain in the United States, but need an attorney. And we were really surprised um, because the private bar has really come together to support our immigrant community. We have a growing list of about 40 volunteer attorneys that are willing to drive out to the middle of nowhere, again, it's the high desert, Adelanto, California, to represent people who are held there because they believe in justice and they believe in making sure that our communities have support. And so Santa Barbara County has really come together to make sure that our local immigrants don't have to be deported if they are eligible to remain in the U.S. So on the right, you'll see one of our pro bono attorneys who represented a case this summer. Um, and so aside from recruiting volunteer attorneys, what the Immigrant Legal Defense Center does is we help our community verify ICE presence with the support of cause. We help individuals find their loved ones once they've been detained. We provide representation to people who are held in these immigrant detention centers and need assistance with bond to be able to be released. Um, and we provide community education so people understand their rights. And we do this uh, through our rapid response network with local community partners. CAUSE has a great um, alert system that allows individuals to be able to, um, to text this number, 24587, and say, hey, I think I see ICE in my community, is this true? Uh, we work together to be able to verify that presence and also dispel myths when it's not accurate. Um, we also do this through our 805 Immigrant Facebook, which you all are welcome to like, um, and we also get referrals from local uh, community nonprofits and agencies and schools. And so when an individual is in need of assistance, it's usually a very, very traumatic experience for your family member to be picked up by ICE. And so they're invited to always call our number and we're, we try to help them as best we can. So our model involves that the Immigrant Legal Defense Center will screen a case, we'll send it out to our volunteer attorneys, somebody will sign up to take it and we'll pair them with an interpreter and a paralegal um, to make sure that they're able to represent the individual well. They're also paired with a mentoring attorney. And again, our Santa Barbara community has really come together to address this issue. One of our, all of our mentoring attorneys, um, our immigration attorneys in the region, Abby Kingston, Arno Jaffe, um, and then as well as other practitioners in LA and San Francisco that assist our volunteer attorneys. And so um, I think Sheriff Brown made a really great um, uh, introduction to SB 54. 
Uh, SB 54 is a state legislation designed to protect the safety and well-being of all Californians um, by ensuring that state and local resources are not used to fuel mass deportations. So I know that in terms of legal defense, you may be wondering, what can I do? I'm not an attorney. What we can do is make sure that we disentangle local law enforcement with ICE, right? Um, so what SB 54 does, and we're huge supporters of this state legislation, is that it prohibits direct transfers to ICE from the county jail, and it prohibits local uh, law enforcement from notifying ICE of release dates, unless these release dates are publicly available, which I th is changing a bit. Um, what it does not do is it does not prohibit ICE from entering the county jails. So I think the best way to kind of talk about SB 54 is um, it's, 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 I'm sure you all heard of the California sanctuary policies, right? That's SB 54. SB 54 is designed to protect individuals, to make sure that victims are still coming forward, um, to make sure that they are able to get protection. And so I think the best way to discuss it is through um, one of our cases. This is the case of Mr. Z, we'll call him. Um, Mr. Z has lived in Santa Barbara County for, 15, for the past 15 years. His children attend our local high schools. He's a father of two U.S. citizen girls, one DACA recipient, um, and he was released from county jail on bail. He was charged with a misdemeanor, um, and I think it's important to remind you all, when somebody is accused of a crime, they're charged with a crime. We in the U.S. believe in innocent until proven guilty, and so... That is one of the things that we'd like to really highlight. Um, for Mr. Z, he was charged with something. His family posted a $10,000 bail. He was, we, we, we talk about SB 54 and that it limits enforcement, but what's actually happening in practice is that ICE is now just going to the, to the jails and picking people up directly. So Mr. Z was released from the county jail. He was handed his belongings. He opened the door to leave the facility his family was waiting outside, and he was picked up by ICE. And this is really devastating because Mr. Z is the sole breadwinner of his family. His DACA recipient daughter had to start working. His wife had to start working. They somehow managed to pay, pay the bail, and then he needed representation because he was now at Adelanto. And so we were able to help him get released on a $5,000 bond. But again, on top of the $10,000 bail, now he has to pay a $5,000 bond. Immigration doesn't have bail bondsmen the way that criminal uh, courts have it. And so we helped him raise the money, mainly through our volunteer attorneys and all of our volunteers, so he could be released back to be with his family. Um, and so that this is a type of case that we, uh, that we help with the, at the Immigrant Legal Defense Center. Um, and I know I'm running out of time, so um, I'll, le I'll leave you with how you can help. Um, if you are an attorney, we would love your assistance with these cases. There are so many of them, and we can only take so many. Um, we really rely on volunteer attorneys, volunteer interpreters, so we're completely volunteer run. Um, except for me. <laughs> and we also really need support with driving. A lot of our families need help with getting a ride to the LA Immigration Court. Sometimes our cases are in San Diego and they need to be transferred. They need a ride to San Diego. Um, so if you're interested in being a driver, you can contact Molly Kellogg at this number and join the Driver's Listos program. And the main way that you can really help our organization, we got a very generous grant from the Fund for Santa Barbara it's our seed money, it was $50,000, um, but we need more donations from the community. And so the volunteer attorneys have really stepped up and said, we care about justice, we care about protecting our families, we care pr about protecting local immigrants. And so now we're inviting you all to also pitch in and make a donation to the center. There's some uh, flyers in the back in case you need more information. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Anai. Once again, this is a time in which you can hold up questions if you have them, and they'll get picked up. Um, our final speaker is Jacqueline Inda. Um, Jackie is the founder and a board member of uh, the Santa Barbara Response Network, uh, another newly formed organization. 
um, which coordinates and highlights local resources that assist and prevent families for official immigrant immigration consultations, bond hearings, legal migrant visas, or status changes in a safe, confidential setting. Jackie was a plaintiff in the lawsuit to end the at-large elections in the city of city council members in Santa Barbara and led the battle to elect rather than appoint a successor to Kathy Murillo in the third district. And here she is, Jackie Inda. Thank you guys for sticking around so long. Let me see if I could play with this gadget here. Santa Barbara Response Network has been around since 2008. And what we basically do is respond to emergencies and crisis, whether that is the debris flows, whether that is a homicide, an IV, whether that is somebody who commits suicide within a school, whether that is a loved one that um, be uh, became indigent because of an accident and affects a community. The Santa Barbara Response Network goes in providing psychological first aid. So what does that have to do with immigration? We all have seen the videos and the YouTube um, clips of families being separated. We have all been impacted by those kinds of traumatic events that we continuously see in our social media feeds and that we hear about in our community. It's impactful to even see all of this data, right? So the Santa Barbara Response Network did what we do best. When there's a crisis, we call out, we cast out the net, get everybody together in a room, not only the service providers, but also the people affected by all of this trauma. That means you, and that means people who are from migrant communities. And we say, let's come together and create solutions of things we can grasp onto within this community. How do we make this place a safer place? How do we continue to work together and how do we unite? And that's really the purpose of, of SBRN along with psychological first aid is to create a safe space that people can then come together and create innovation. So while I appreciate all of the information that we've just received, what we're really talking about is social justice, equality, and dignity. So why we do what we do, when we meet, why we were formed, and why we created a subcommittee called the Immigration Advocacy Collaborative is basically just that, is bringing the community together and create the safe space. And we'll go over the different slides that'll talk a little bit more about everything else in here. We've all heard the majority minority impacts. We've all talked about how um, the community uh, from the migrants standpoint is hurting. Uh, one of the things that we did in bringing people together is listen to all of the different things that we all have in common and try to figure out how to make a better system in this community. In developing that conversation and allowing those spaces to happen with the careful lens of psychological first aid, we were able to listen to all of the different things that we need locally, right? We need folks that are a part of the community that see these images and they hurt, to feel like they have a place that they can act so that they can heal as well. We need a space for our community to be able to call maybe a one single point of entry system and be able to find out all of the resources that there are. And we need to create a system that will surround and protect our community as a whole. So a couple of facts. I know that you guys have already covered a few facts. We're talking about specifically for the city of Santa Barbara. We're talking about the 
census data, so 46% of the community is Latino community. Most come from migrant descent. About 100,000 people in the city, you add 50,000 that come in to visit. About 25% of them are undocumented, pending legal status. Only about 6% of the individuals countywide will need deportation hearing processes to be addressed. Those statistics come from the Mexican consulate. More facts. Our federal administration has a mission to lower legal migration by 20%, deporting illegal, illegal migration, and enforcing deportations by, in, by an increase of over 40%. Now, what I mean by lowering legal migration, okay? If you take the statistics that we talked about countywide, and you actually look at what's happening here in this county, we've actually met that goal. The Mexican consulate has identified that in this county, about 20% of folks that are from migrant community are so scared of what's happening with all of these changes that they're just keeping in the shadows, refusing to move anything, not applying for things that they could potentially apply for. And these are folks that own businesses, these are folks that maybe own homes, are retiring, have lived here most of their life. Those are people who are not going through the criminal justice system, not looking at bonds, but specifically just deciding not to move a single thing so that they can be as invisible as possible and continue to function in our society. Even more facts. When you create a fear of deportation, US born children are impacted in schools. They take the stories they hear in home. Now think about that. Let's say you're a child that's five, six, seven years old, and your parents are at somebody's birthday, and people in that space are talking about the deportation that just happened to maybe the next door neighbor, to maybe somebody that they know, and they start to talk about how that might impact them. Children, even though we don't think that they're listening, are listening. But they're getting the information differently. And because of their age, they're not thinking ICE, police officer, firefighter, all different. What they're getting is those people might hurt my family. And my family is how I survive. And that's the children that we are taking to our schools. The more difficult part, think about yourself. Think about somebody breaking into your car in the middle of the night. And you waking up in the morning going, man, I need to call the police department. And when the police department comes out to do an investigation to get their information and you start to ask around in your neighbors, hey, did you happen to see anything? Because we all do that, right? Imagine that the person across the street from you has some kind of fear of deportation. Are they going to raise their hand and say, yeah, I'll be your witness. I saw exactly what happened. I recorded it on my phone. Probably not. The reality is we still receive calls to our 911 system. People are not just not calling 911. When there's an emergency, people call. We rely on that. But what happens when you're preparing a case and it gets transferred over to the DA's office and they can't find witnesses and they don't have the evidence to move the case forward or even the victims can't be found, the cases start to drop. So we're talking about social justice and equality, right? What can you do? One of the things that we can do locally, of course, we want to change things nationally, but what we can do here locally is use your resources. Everybody has them. We're, as an immigration advocacy collaborative, bringing together all of your resources and identifying them into different pockets and creating a system that can better suit our community as a whole. By doing that, the very first thing we did 
is start to create resolutions so that every city and within our county, they can adopt a resolution that says, we believe in our due process, but we also believe in all of our community being treated with respect. And in this county and in this city, we're going to respect every single person as an equal, regardless of status. And you can imagine that this might be easy, but in reality, it's quite a challenge to try to get local jurisdictions to actually create a resolution, a promise to a community. In some places, it might be easier than others. For example, the county of Santa Barbara adopted the resolution. A week later, they adopted another one, and then it went to uh, the federal administration. Both of them did. In Goleta, again, the same thing. They passed two resolutions, and they're on the fast track to figuring out ways to better communicate with our migrant community in all different languages. But it's a challenge for all of our local jurisdictions to think about making that promise long term to a migrant community. So we have some work to do in that, which means that if you have the time and you want to roll up your sleeves and you want to go to councils, to your local councils, whether it's Carpinteria or Lompoc or Santa Barbara and say, hey, I want this promise to my community as well because we're all equal, then you've got some work to do and we can do it together, right? Some people always ask themselves, you know what, I've been in so many marches, what am I really doing? What you're really doing is you're showing with visibility that in this community we are all one and that when you don't respect due process when there are questions, we're all less safe. And these visible acts actually help those people in the shadows feel a little bit more empowered because you become the voice, the channel of that energy. So keep doing what you're doing, participate in those ways. And if you're a part of the collaborative, you also get those updates. As of course, you see them all over with social media, but those are the things that are important to those people who are sitting in the shadows. And whether it's immigration, whether it's victim rights, trust and believe there's always a child looking at what you're doing in this community. And even though it feels like you're doing it over and over and over again and you may not get anywhere, you're actually doing something for those individuals going, hey, those people are standing up for me here. Okay, so there's some people that don't like to do the marches maybe don't really want to do the community involvement with getting resolutions passed. But another focus that we've also done is, of course, we've talked about this family separation. Well, guess what? We're talking, the stats that you looked at are for children that are separated within the United States. There is a lot of migration that happens to the border. And when you're on the other side of the border, you don't get transported into the system here you get stuck at the other side of the border without your parents. So that means being in detention centers there, getting screened and transported to whatever state you come from or whatever country you come from, being placed in a detention center there until you're in an orphanage, and so on and so on and so on with absolutely nothing. So what we've done to help people get through the coping of all of the things that you've seen is we've created drives that will get these over to those detention centers at the other side of the, uh, of the other side of the border. And we've done this as a partnership with the Response Network as a collaborative with the Mexican consulate and the embassy to be able to use your skills. If all you have is being able to get basic needs to the other side and we can help you get there, then you're doing something, right? It's getting action into what we're talking about here. What does equity mean? It means that when there are a large percentage of a community, like 46% of our community needing help, we create a system that is equitable and equal to all of the other systems. And I know I'm running out of time. All of this stuff is in that back table. But I want to leave you with one thought. Why do we have a single point of entry for people who are homeless? Why do we have a single point of entry for people who are disabled? for children that have services zero to five. Why? Because our communities, whatever they are, 
don't have all of the resources and the phone numbers in the back of their brain when they need them. Not even us, right? A single point of entry provides quality and services uniquely to everybody based on that. You call the one number, they refer you to all of the services that you need, and they have somebody following you to make sure that those services are actually giving you the services that they are saying they are giving you. Why don't we have that for our migrant community? It's easy enough to build. We already have the models. Equity means just that. Equality means just that when you have 46% of the community that is, that is from migrant descent. Now, how do we do that? One of the things that we do is we meet every Wednesday at Trinity Church at 5.30. You can come in and help create these kinds of solutions. And if you have a skill, if you have something to give, you get involved. Because now is not the time to stand still. Now is not the time to not do anything. And now is not the time to just play on the phone with social media. It's time to act. And that's what we're talking about with a collaborative. It's not only bringing resources together, but bringing all of your resources to the table and together acting as one community. So we thank you for that. Thank you, Jackie. Um, once again, if you have more questions, they'll be collected. Um, we have about 35 minutes to um, go through some of the questions that um, have already been handed up here. And um, uh, an awful lot of them are not surprisingly for the sheriff, but there are many for other people as well. So I'm going to try to try to spread things around. Um, the first question I will direct to uh, Sheriff Brown, however, which was, um, can you talk a little bit about what the difference is between a charter city and other cities? What um, makes a sanctuary city? And one question on that was, if we are a sanctuary state, why does the Santa Barbara County Sheriff still pursue undocumented individuals? So if you could try to clarify that a little bit, that would be helpful. Um, okay, well, I can't really give you a definitive definition about a charter city. Um, I'm going to have to leave that for the, uh, for the lawyers. It's a, it is a distinction in terms of the governance of the city, and it, um, I think it, it, my limited knowledge of it is that it is um, a city that is responsible for um, developing its own uh, rules of enforcing the law in certain areas. And um, they tend to be larger cities, larger communities, um, that's about the extent of what I can tell you about charter cities. I can't give you a definitive definition of that. Um, the second question was, what makes a sanctuary state? Is that? Oh, what makes a sanctuary city? Um, some cities have adopted resolutions uh, de defining themselves as sanctuary cities. Um, the SB 54 was was dubbed, you know, the sanctuary state law. Uh, even the author basically said that that was a misnomer, that the reality is uh, there's no such thing as a sanctuary state. All of our states are, are part of the federal government. The federal government has the authority and uh, passes and enforces immigration law, so a state can't secede from that or not be part of that. It's, uh, so in, in many respects, it's a symbolic uh, title rather than, than that. And then the last question was kind of a loaded question, but uh, if I got it right, is uh, if, if we are a sanctuary state. state, why does the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office, what was the last part of that, pursue? Pursue undocumented individuals. Yeah, I, I guess I can just tell you, the only undocumented uh, people that we, we would, would pursue, pursue would be the people who are from and, and at the time, the time we're, we're pursuing, pursuing them from the we don't know, don't know if they're, if they're documented, documented or undocumented. undocumented. Part, Part of the, of the problem, problem we have, have in trying to prepare for tonight, we don't have a lot of statistics because we don't keep statistics of how many people that we arrest are documented or undocumented. That's just something that doesn't fit into our um, our equation. What we end, you know, what I said before stands. We protect everybody in this community regardless of their status. On the same token, we will 
uh, go after and arrest anybody in the community regardless of their status if they prey upon other people in the community. So um, I, I can't really you know, go beyond that we, other than to just emphasize again that we do not engage in immigration enforcement. We do not ever go out and ask someone in the field what is your immigration status and uh, if they were to say that, or if we were to find out that they were undocumented, you know, we don't make arrests. We don't refer those people to uh, federal authorities. They operate uh, in that arena on their own. Does anyone want to respond uh, or say anything else about that? Okay, then um, let's move on. Um, yes. yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't tell them. Yeah. yeah. They, 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 they all know they only have three minutes. And um, you can hold up your 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 things. Um, there are there are so many questions that have, go in all different directions. Um, I'm going to ask this of anyone who wants to answer it um, up there. It says, "Why is ICE still coming to Santa Barbara?" when our whole economy rests on undocumented workers in restaurants, gardens, field work, et cetera. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know that anyone has a, an answer to that one, but I wonder if anyone wants to speak to it. I could just briefly, they're mandated by the federal government to do the work that they're doing. Um, so they're going to go into communities, communities whether it's Santa Barbara, Barbara uh, to, to conduct, conduct that, that work. work. Um, the policies have changed, changed as, 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 as I stated. stated. Um, now, now they're, they're doing, doing much more targeted enforcement. We don't see so large scale raises we did, did in the 80s. Uh, and so it's, it's just their mandate to do that. Well, as long as you're answering it, I'm going to give you another <laughs> question, um, Erica. It says, what is the Congress doing to keep immigration driving down wages, workers' rights, and worker health and safety protections? What is he doing for immigration? What is he doing to keep immigration from driving down wages, workers' rights, etc.? Um, driving it. down. Um, People have hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'm interpreting the question correctly. Is it immigrants from taking away? Jobs from American citizens is that? I think that's what, or, or from, or from people here legally. Being a vulnerable labor pool that can't unionize, that can't uh, advocate for ocean protection, sexual harassment, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. well, well, starting, starting from, from the, the level of talk over children who are brought here as childhood arrivals, um, he has pushed for legislation that would allow them to become legal permanent residents and uh, hopefully eventually citizens who would give them uh, much more lively political voice as well as the ability to stand out and let their status be known of what their background was. Um, there's also legislation that he has co-sponsored that would uh, allow a pathway for citizenship from, um, from DACA recipients to apply for their parents. So those families would eventually get into a legal status which would allow them to come out of the shadows um, and do things like unionize if that's something that they wanted to do. Um, so that's a kind of another topic. Uh, uh, I think um, Sheriff Brown, were you waving at me, or did I'm not? I just, wanted to, I just wanted to jump in with a follow-up to the last question. Oh, I didn't we'll get, get a chance to. That. But if, if other panelists yeah. want to address this one, I'd be happy to. Well, I wanted to address the first question, which Erica covered. Um, it is a f they're federally mandated to be here, but uh, elections really do matter. So as we saw um, in Santa Maria a few years ago, we didn't, we didn't have, have an ICE processing, processing center, center in Santa Maria. Santa Maria. It, was it was located in La Hope. Um, and, and so the city council was the one that made that decision to get it there, and now it can't be removed outside of federal mandates. So there's little that we can do to stop ICE from detaining people, but what we can do is disentangle, again, law enforcement from ICE and make sure that the people that do have pending charges or people who are being picked up um, don't end up in deportation proceedings. Okay. Um, I'm going to get back to you on, you'll get another chance when you're talking about something else to go back to that one. Um, I'm going to direct this to Jackie because you sort of started talking about that. A lot of people have basically said, we're trying to figure out what we can do to be effective. What is the most important thing that an individual 
who is not, not an immigration lawyer, lawyer can, can do to be helpful. helpful. And, and then, then somebody, somebody just gave me something that said, you said the IAC meets on Wednesdays at Trinity, isn't it on Thursdays? So, so I'm giving you that opportunity as well. <laughs> we changed it from Wednesdays to, uh, from Thursdays to Wednesdays just because of the, um, uh, the need for coordination with the Progressive Coalition and they meet on Thursday sometimes, and so it was just easier for us to move it to a Wednesday when everybody has more flexibility. Uh, and with regard to what you can potentially do, there are so many things going on locally. There are issues that impact schools. There are issues that impact communities. If somebody's following what's going on in San Marcos High School, you can tell that there are a lot of social justice issues impacting our migrant children and our migrant communities. So what can you do? Get involved. If it means going to the Progressive Coalition, if it means going to the IAC and learning about what's going on, if it means the only part of getting involved is going to a vigil, the only part of getting involved is helping with collection drives, then that's what you can do. But if it also means what you can do is pick up the phone and call your city council member and say, hey, why aren't we passing a resolution to keep a promise to make sure all of our communities being treated equally, then that's something else you can do. But get involved. I know that Anaï spoke about attorneys and needing resources and needing folks that could translate. There are many skills that can be put to work here. So get involved. And I, I guess I'll leave it with that. You can go to the IAC, get involved with the Progressive Coalition, which is a partner, CAUSE, which actually does amazing things throughout the community. But one of the things that we are def desperately advocating for, which we will actually address once the foundations fully get a grasp on it, is creating equity with a single point of entry system. And so if you have some resources around that, some ideas around that, come and join us and, and be a part of that change. Anyone want to, anything else up there? Okay, um, this is going to be open to anybody. Um, what do you expect the effect will be of a citizenship or, um, uh, I guess it's a citizenship question in the census? As it, for there, there is a question that is being, that is going to go on, on, on to, to the census that's going to ask people about are they citizens, are they, um, and what do you think that's going to have happen? What, what's going to make that make happen as a result of that? The estimation is that uh, individuals will be reluctant to add in themselves and their family members, their entire households, even if somebody in the house has a status. What that means for the impact in our communities is that there's going to be a less count of how many individuals actually reside in our areas. State and federal government uses those numbers to determine how many resources for social services, for police and fire, um, for almost every social structure that we have coming in, at least from the federal government down to the state and the local. Um, so it could have a huge impact on communities that have a large migrant population who are just going to be afraid to put the number out there, put their name out there, um, for fear that it will be turned over to ICE and that information will be used um, for deportation proceedings in the future. I could add just a couple of thoughts. Most of our migrant families, or most of our children from migrant descent, they've lived in this community forever. They've participated in census before. <coughs> in 2015, we had a different federal administration than the one that we had previous to that. And the one that was previous to that didn't have the numbers that we saw in the 2015 one. So does it impact? Yes, it does. Because when people are fearful, they're reluctant to participate. But remember that we're not talking about a migrant community that shifts. We're talking about a migrant community that makes this their home, that has potentially participated in this before. So it's about going out there and educating folks, getting involved with not only the English-speaking media, but all of the Spanish-speaking media, which are, um, some of our agencies uh, don't pay into. And supporting that community and that language to say, hey, this census is important. And that takes skill and time and it takes resources, right? So um, it is important to know that there is a little bit of history there, that the last census was driven pretty well with that kind of message in the Latino community. And that those folks will participate in the census again. 
if given the correct information. Thank you. Um, Sheriff Brown, um, I'm gonna let you, number one, get, get, address whatever it is you wanted, and I can give you two other questions at the same time. <laughs> Um, the first one is, would you support informing those incarcerated of their immigration rights, such as distributing booklets or pamphlets that inform inmates of their rights? And the second one is, I understand that the jail is now publishing a list of individuals to be released from the jail, and that ICE uses this list to pick up undocumented persons. Is this true? And if so, do you think it's contrary to the spirit of state law? Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanted to back up and, and just uh, the question that came a, about in terms of why is ICE operating in the field in Santa Barbara? And I just wanted to, to throw out there, and I, I don't want this to be an I, I told you so or we told you so, but one of the things that the State Sheriff's Association was saying at the time when SB 54 was proposed was that if this was enacted, it would change the way that ICE operated. And in, in the past, ICE operated almost exclusively in Santa Barbara County by uh, taking inmates uh, from the jail who were also wanted for federal immigration violations and for taking them out of, at the time, in the Lompoc Center and then the, uh, what became the Santa Maria Center, uh, really primarily as a result of uh, taking inmates out of the federal prison in Lompoc. And uh, that was it was it was unheard of i mean i i can't i can't remember either in my experience as a police chief or as sheriff up until the last year ice operating out in the field they certainly had done it years and years ago there were there were some raids on on restaurants and and businesses and farm fields and so forth but the the typical uh field operations in santa barbara county were almost non-existent and certainly not anything that we were aware of at, at the local level. But what we feared was that if um, this law passed and if ICE wasn't uh, able to pursue their mandate, as, as mentioned uh, earlier, that they would ultimately go out into the community. And that's what they're doing now. And they are, uh, by all indications, targeting people who have committed criminal offenses and also happen to be um, uh, undocumented and have, 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 do not have uh, documentation. But the problem is the collateral effect that was also mentioned, where they'll go to arrest one person who's wanted because he has a previous criminal history. But with that person happens to be a friend or a brother or someone who just happens to be in the wrong place at the right time. And that person ends up getting arrested collaterally. And I would submit to you that wouldn't have happened beforehand. With respect to... Um, supporting uh, the notification of rights of inmates uh, with respect to their rights as, as uh, immigrants. Uh, really, the Truth Act, the modifications to the Truth Act have, and the Trust Act have really um, made that point kind of moot. Because at this point, if ICE comes in and wants to interview, they still have the right to be in the jail. They still have the right to request to interview an inmate. But if they do that, we are required to notify the inmate of that and to give them a form, which basically they have to review and sign that says they either want to or don't want to participate in that interview. And it basically tells them, and again, the verbiage from, from the law, tells them that they don't have to submit to that interview. And as a result of that, there's been a complete chilling effect on interviews between ICE agents and inmates in the jail. I asked my people today in preparation for this, are we aware of of any that have happened, and there have been a, a couple of attempts perhaps, but, but none that they're aware of where there actually has been someone who's submitted to that actual interview as a result of that. In terms of the publishing of a list, we do publish a list of uh, who is in our jail. Uh, it's not a, um, it's on our website. And so in other words, if you have someone that you're inquiring about, you can go on that website and determine if they're in our jail. And, and there is information that's publicly available, which includes the release date that that person is in jail. This is something that's a feature of a jail management uh, system that we had been in, uh, in, in the process of switching over to for about two years prior to the enactment of SB 54. It's not a product of SB 54. But it is something that is obviously being used. Um, it's available to the general public, and it is used by ICE. ICE gets, uh, 
wind to the fact that someone is going to be released. And uh, it does, in, in certain instances, bring them to the jail, and they do uh, make arrests as a result of that. Do I think that it is in conflict with the spirit of the law? Um, no, not really, because the law specifically uh, grants that exception. There is language specifically that says that information cannot be released unless it is made publicly available, and that's what we're doing. You can argue that it's, you know, um, you know, it, it shouldn't be done or it should be done, but the reality is the law does permit it, and we're trying to follow the law as closely as we can. Does anyone want to respond on any of that, Anna E? Yeah, I'll just add, um, I think that uh, the comment about, you know, now ICE is going to go into into homes, and, and they've ICE has always done that through something called targeted enforcement actions. ICE has always been in the community. It's just the community never really spoke out about it. And it's only been until recently that local community members have really stepped up to try to figure out what's going on with ICE here locally. Um, a, a lot of the targeted enforcement actions, a lot of the deportations that have been taking place all go under the radar. I get calls from people who are driving their kids to school and I stop them and they don't know who to call and they don't know what to do. This isn't something that is new. It's always been happening. Um, and another thing I wanted to, to point out is that um, the forms that uh, Sheriff Brown is talking about um, is, part, is something encompassed under the Trust Act. It basically says that people, um, if ICE wants to speak to someone in the jail, the jail is required to notify this person through a form. So an individual who's undocumented and is sitting in county jail and is not happy about being in county jail gets a form and says, ICE wants to speak to you, um, they can say yes or no. And a copy of that is given to ICE if the person says no. So um, I think it's important to, to highlight that, um, again, the disentanglement, right? Do we want to be a Santa Barbara that protects people regardless of their immigration status? Do we want to do something different? I think that's, that's where the crux of the issue lies. Thank you. Um, this question is addressed to Anna E or Jackie. Do you believe that anyone who can get here has the right to stay here? Uh, many undocumented immigrants are in the U.S. on expired visas, such as student or tourist visas. Uh, many, perhaps most, are not Latino. Where would you draw the line? I think that uh, for the U.S. has a has a history of embracing people um, of all nationalities and of all statuses to some respect. Um, I can tell you that um, I saw a tweet earlier today. I'm going to bring it back to the young people that said. I want to make sure that I welcome to this country anyone who hasn't done anything extraordinary, someone who hasn't gone to Harvard, someone who hasn't won a White House award. If they are just an ordinary human being, I'll accept them into this country. And I think that, that the question makes a few assumptions, right? So um, our current immigration system doesn't allow individuals to get in a line and ask to come to the United States. You, especially people in Mexico, have to apply to enter, and there are huge visa backlogs. They're processing applications from the 1990s right now. So if there was a way for people to come to the US the right way, quote unquote, I think people would do that. In addition to that, asylum seekers are entering the United States, presenting at a port of entry saying that they fear for their lives in their home country and asking for asylum. And that's, you know, doing it the right way. And what happens to them is they get placed into these detention centers, they get separated from their children. And so I think that we need to reform the bigger system in order to be able to address that. And I would just add that in reality, what we're talking about is practicality and what's real, right? We can't assume that theory is going to make sense because theory is just that. What we're talking about is the reality of the community that we live in. 
Yes, we can try to change things nationally, federally or statewide, but we're talking about the community that we live in with the people that live here now and the way that they're treated. And equity and equality is not that much to ask for. So are we really talking about a question that talks about theory? Well, maybe. But the reality that we face on a day-to-day -day basis is that the person that's sitting next to you may or may not have status, and that's okay because that's the reality we all live in. So why not make it equitable, and why not make it equal? And why not allow our due process to take shape? So a theory is a theory. What my beliefs may be may be different than others, but accepting reality and coming to innovative solutions that's the way to go. Thank you. Um, Sheriff Brown, I got this qu question in a couple of different forms from different people, but it was um, about the um, example you gave of uh, the child molester in Ventura who was released on bail and um, fled. And the question they ask is, why is an accused child molester who's a clear flight risk being granted bail in the first place, regardless of immigration status? Well. The reason for that is that the current system, the current bail system is flawed and it really, you know, was ripe for reform. We're going to be seeing reform with SB 10, which remains to be seen if that's the right type of reform. But the reality is now uh, there is a bail system. There's a constitutional right to bail, arguably. And um, all it takes at this point uh, in our in our law is a certain amount of money to bail out if you're charged with a crime. So it's not whether that person's a flight risk or not doesn't become a factor because they're uh, you know bail if bail is made. Um, if someone is a um, a known flight risk, there is an opportunity for law enforcement to go in front of a court to make an argument, and uh, we actually had a case like that that occurred with a rape case that involved an Eastern European uh, person who had raped someone and uh, was trying to make bail, and we were able to get to the court, and the court did order him to surrender his passport before he would bail, but um, it, in, in reality, if, if, you know, if the guy who's working at 10 o'clock at night, you know, and who's receiving a bail bond or bail cash from uh, someone isn't necessarily going to know the mechanics of the case as to whether or not that's, that person would be a flight risk. So um, I think I'm hopeful that what we'll see with the new law is um, uh, better opportunity, everyone being screened, and if someone is a risk to either reoffend or to flee, then that person will be kept in jail regardless of their ability to uh, raise the money. Anyone else on that one? All right, Erica, I'm going to give you the last question. Uh, or it's actually two questions, and I'm, I'm not sure whether they fit together or not. Um, the first of them is, at the federal level, which policy movement is the most urgent or detrimental? In other words, what should we be lobbying you or, your co or our congressman about? What, what's the most important thing going on? And then there's another question which goes in another direction, but I'm going to give it to you now, which is, are unaccompanied minors being sent to temporary shelters in order to fulfill the federal government's promise to keep for-profit detention centers filled to capacity? All right, so in terms of specifically uh, what's happening with immigration, I'd say what I mentioned about the public charge and the rule change is probably the biggest um, issue that's come up recently. And like I said, you have until December 10th, the 60-day comment period, to talk about that because it's really going to have an impact on not only the communities that are currently here, um, there's undocumented um, individuals who are here who are still eligible to apply for legal permanent residence. It does require that they return to their country for the interview. And when they do return to their country for their interview, it's quite possible, if this rule change goes through, that they will not be able to come back into the United States because they're not able to meet um, the, that change in what is considered public charge. Uh, so that could lead to even further family separations. Um, so I'd say that's probably the most emergent. But again, the funding that's um, coming down on December 7th with uh, the government, or not the government potentially such shutting down, but um, the continuing resolution expiring. There's a lot, a lot of money. It's um, $63 billion that could go to funding 
uh, the border wall, increased security, um, and there's a lot that's also in that package that I didn't mention, including increased funding for ICE. Um, they've said that they want to expand the presence of ICE throughout the United States, and this would provide the funding to do just that. So we could see increased enforcement here locally um, should that piece of legislation go through. I imagine there's going to be other pieces that come through, but um, definitely having your voice heard at the public charge level. Um, in terms of the unaccompanied minors, um, it's a mix. There's nonprofit organizations, religious organizations, and for-profit organizations, businesses that are um, making up these shelters. The ones I mentioned specifically for Thorneo is a private contractor company that was traditionally um, used for military government contracting. So a lot of the facilities look like what would be in Iraq or Afghanistan and building up a quick shelter. Um, so there is profit that's coming off of that. I can't say it's exclusively for profit, um, but there are, as I said, nonprofit and faith-based organizations as well in those more permanent shelters, but the temporary ones have been private contracts. Thank you. I, I want to thank all of you for your time and coming to us and um, being, being so <laughs> forthcoming. Um, of course, I want to thank the library, I want to thank Gary, I want to thank all of you. Um, most importantly, I think, on behalf of the League, I want to remind you that uh, you have your opportunity to do the one thing we can all do in, in three weeks, or right away, actually. I've already done it. You can vote. Um, please do that, um, and uh, please come back for more of our forums. We uh, appreciate it. Take care. Have a nice night.